Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Highly Unlikely podcast. I could not be more excited for you to hear today's conversation. This episode is a live recording of a conversation that I had with NFL quarterback Carson Wentz. And Carson shares about his faith, his faith journey, his family, but also the work that he's doing through the AO1 Foundation. So Carson's a great man of integrity and character, and I can't wait for you to hear what he has to say. So sit back, but lean in and hear this conversation with quarterback Carson Wentz. Well, thank you. I'm glad to see you too. Hey, this is a special day, and uh, Carson and his family have exerted a lot of energy for the AO1 Foundation this week. Camp Conquerors just ended today up in Washburn. There's, they've also just been through the craziest year, and I know that you love him and care about him and have been cheering for him on a screen. So one more time, will you just welcome him to Evangel? Thank you, guys. So, same question. It's been a wild year. A lot of people have seen news and just kind of, you've been moved around. And uh, I think a lot of people just want to know, how are you? How are you doing? Yeah, doing well. Um, it has been a wild year. It's been a whirlwind. Uh, really, the last couple of years, as I think we've all gone through a wild couple of years in some way, shape, or form. Um, and ours professionally is um, just throwing another uh, wrinkle into the equation uh, the last couple of years, but it's been fun, honestly. I have an amazing wife and two kids that are resilient, and we're just bouncing around figuring this this thing called life out and having fun doing it. Um, but we're doing well, actually. It's been it's been a fun transition. I'm thankful to have my family, have my crew um, right there with me that supports me and um, having fun along the way. Cool. So I know maybe there's somebody here who doesn't know who you are, maybe. Maybe. But why don't you tell everybody who you are, yeah. kind of your history, and then uh, where you guys have been in the last five, seven years? Yeah. Uh, so I actually grew up here in Bismarck. I went to uh, Centennial Elementary School. Um, maybe some Rough Riders out there. Um, then I went to Horizon Middle School, uh, followed that up with Bismarck Century High School. Um, yeah. So... Quite the journey, uh, younger years. Then I went to North Dakota State, and there's probably no Bison fans out there. Um, went to North Dakota State for five years. Uh, had a lot of fun there playing ball and um, just growing up, quite frankly. Um, and then uh, got drafted by the Eagles, spent five years in Philly. It was uh, a wild ride there in Philly. Um, and then I spent this last year in Indy uh, with the Colts, and now I am a commander, which is weird for everybody to say, um, but we're getting used to calling them the commanders now, and uh, yeah, excited for this upcoming season, and we've kind of bounced around as a family, obviously, accordingly, um, but just like I said, we're having fun doing it. Cool. Well, so glad that you're here, and I know it's been a wild week, but go ahead. I know it's been a wild week for you guys, but thank you for taking time to swing by and just talk about what's on your heart, what Jesus has done in your life, and the foundation. We're going to get to all of that uh, in a little bit, but uh, I just want you to know um, that this is not a Sunday that's just about like, oh, let's get an NFL quarterback, and lots of people will come to church. The reason we asked Carson to come is because um, seeing his life uh, from a distance, but also up close, just knowing like he's the real deal. And he's a person of character and a person of integrity. And he loves Jesus. And he follows Jesus, not out of convenience, but from conviction. And he's somebody just like any other guest speaker that I would want people in our church to hear from and to say, man, there's something about his life and his behavior that I can model for me and for my family. And so we respect you. I'm grateful for you. And uh, even hearing you speak five years ago to today, it's just awesome how much you've, you were mature then, but now even more the wisdom God has given you. Uh, you're like at that veteran level, right? In so many ways. And so uh, we're thankful for that and for the experience that God has given you. But I know you care a lot about Haiti and I want uh, you to introduce your family. We care about Haiti, but I want you to talk about how you met Maddie in Haiti and yep. what that looked like too. Yeah, so um, went to Haiti. Well, first of all, family, uh, we got two little girls. Um, Hadley is two years old and Hudson is seven months old. And uh, my wife, Maddie and I, uh, going on four years of marriage. That'll be our four-year anniversary in July. Um, yeah. 
And they are not, they were at the first two services, but it's nap time, so they are not here right now. Um, but uh, no, it's been, it's been quite the ride with them. But my, uh, my wife and I, we met in Haiti. Um, so I was on a mission trip after my rookie year. Uh, go down there, and I'm just down there with, uh, with the teammates and the church that I went to in Philly, and just a couple days, and my wife uh, was actually an intern at the time, so she, when she was in college, she would go intern uh, with Mission of Hope, which is an organization in Haiti that we now work with, um, so she was interning there, and the last day, let's just say I got a really good tour guide, uh, my wife was the tour guide, uh, the last day, a tour of the campus, and it was a fantastic tour. And next thing you know, we started talking, and like it was just a really cool kind of God moment. Um, at least for me, her story might be a little different. Um, but long story short, like 15 months later, we're married, and um, just really cool to see you know both of us. We were just going there to serve. We just wanted to go help and just draw closer to God, make a difference, all of those things. We weren't looking for someone in that kind of season of life, so to speak. And uh, God just kind of made it happen. God opened the door and, um, you know, we're not perfect, but we were striving to live for God in that moment. And we met and here we are still funny. It still kind of gives me chills to say we're going on year four and we have two kids and our life is kind of crazy now. Um, but we're having fun and we're grateful that we did meet in Haiti and, um, kind of is a pretty cool story. Yeah. I think the rest of the story goes that maybe you made some sort of a move via sending some flowers and Maddie kind of pumped the brakes because <laughs> yeah. Am I oversharing? Nope, that that did happen. <laughs> I mean, let okay. So it's, it's the 12:30 say whatever you want. June and I'm like, okay, well, we've been talking a little bit, so I'm going to be very romantic. I'm going to send flowers, but just, it's, I'm sending flowers to Haiti. Like, that's a different animal. Like, we're not just calling the local floral shop to go deliver flowers. So these flowers show up like two days late. Um, but the fact of the matter is I actually got flowers to her in Haiti to the mission. Um, and long story short, she basically told me to kick rocks and we didn't talk for a month. Um, <laughs> and then she came to her senses and then we got married a year later, so... So, yeah. You didn't say that stuff at the first two services, no, but... It seems like the crowd. It seems <laughs> yeah. like the rowdy crowd that wants to hear that, so... <laughs> <laughs> the reason I bring it up is because I think part of Maddie's reasoning was that she really wanted to be focused on the work she was doing in Haiti, and I love that about you guys, your groundedness, your focus... Um, even just not wanting to get distracted from what God has called you to do. And I think that's been, you've been rooted in that for a long time. Um, but I know your life wasn't always that way. You know, in high school, it was a different experience with church and with God. And uh, can you tell us what was the turning point? What changed things for you? Yeah. So growing up here, kind of went to church, did, did the church things, you know, checked the box as a Christian. And, um, you know, I was a good kid. I tried to stay out of trouble. You know, I thought I was right with God. I thought I was a, a Christian and a follower of Christ because uh, I was a good person. You know, I was uh, tried to stay out of trouble, all those things. Heck, I would pray um, before games, hoping it would give me a little luck, you know, on the field, um, all of those things. So I just thought that's what it meant to be a Christian. And I think, a, that's, that's wrong, and A, I think that's what the enemy wants us to believe, uh, and I think the enemy wins uh, when we tell ourselves, I'm a good person, that's, I'm right with God, all of those things, and so then I go to college, and I'm a freshman, and I'm away from my family now, away from friends, everything's different, and we're stretching. I'm in my first ever practice as a bison. I'm stretching, and a senior quarterback at the time named Dante Perez just straight up looks at me, and he's like, hey man, have you ever read the Bible? And I'm just like, bro, I do not want to talk about this right now. My head is spinning. I'm, I'm away from my family. There's a lot going on. I'm just trying to remember these plays before I screw them up on the practice field. Um, but at the time, something was stirring inside of me that, you know, I'm 18 years old now. I'm away from my family. It's time for me to kind of more or less grow up and, and be convicted about what I'm convicted about and, and figure this, this whole thing out on my own. And long story short, him and I end up meeting up the entire uh, first semester, go through the whole New Testament and my view of being a follower of Christ completely flipped on its head. And it was no longer, you know, you're reading Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved 
blah, 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 not by works. And so I hear that and I'm like, well, shoot, I thought my works were good enough. You know, I'd, I'd look to my left, I'd look to my right, I'd say, oh, okay, I'm probably a little better person than that person. Well, not quite, but I'm close. Like, that is what earthly minds, that's what we want to do. And we always want to compare ourselves to each other. Uh, and that's not what we're supposed to do because our comparison is Christ. And ultimately, we'll never measure up. But the fact is he already measured up for us and all we have to do is give our full surrender to him and give our life to him. And it changed my perspective radically and, and I now got to live out of the overflow of God's love. I really understood how much God loves me in that moment. And um, now even as having my own kids, I understand God's love in a completely new way uh, and just in awe of how much God loves us because he sent his only son. I mean, I love my daughter Hadley and my daughters Hadley and Hudson more than I can even put into words. Um, and that love is not even close to how much God loves us. And that blew my mind. Uh, and now it continues to blow my mind every time I look in my little girl's eyes. Um, and so once I understood God's love in a deeper way, it changed my perspective. And I've, you know, I'd love to tell you from then on out, like it was smooth sailing and it's perfect. You know, I'm a perfect Christian, all these things. That's not how it works. Um, life is still hard. There's still highs and lows. There's still spiritually highs and lows. You go through peaks and valleys and, and all of those things, but to have a deep sense of peace and a deep sense of joy through it all, um, because of my faith in Christ has really changed, uh, my, the, the landscape of my eternity for, uh, for the better. I'm trying to tell him whenever the football gig is up, preaching, you know, could be a thing. That's just so good and such good truth. I know a huge part of your story, what's foundational is Dante and Mallory in your wife's life, really sitting down with you guys and walking you through scripture, teaching you about God's word and really discipling you. And uh, how do you still seek to do that today? Why is that so important? Yeah, I just think, you know, you read the word and you open the, the scripture or you just know you hear about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're like, God even created, he just created us all to be in relationships. He created us to be relational. Uh, he sent the disciples out. Jesus, Jesus sent the disciples out in twos because we're created to be in relationship. And you think of, um, you know, I was just asked, what about your faith story? And Dante Perez comes to mind. And I'm sure every one of you as a follower of Christ, if, when you're asked, tell me your story, there's a face that comes to mind. There's a person that comes to mind. There's somebody that you admired or looked up to or was bold enough to say, hey, bro, have you ever read the Bible? Or, hey, come with me to church. Or, hey, what about my small group that I lead? Come on over. Let's, let's talk about the Bible. And I think for me, I, I look at that and I go, I don't want to miss out on that opportunity to be that person to somebody else. You know, I think that's why I believe, and I know that's why God put us here to make disciples, to live on mission, to be bold enough to have those conversations. And I would just challenge everybody to um, ultimately think back and be thankful for that person that was maybe your Dante Perez in your life, but also how can I be that person to somebody else? How can I be that bridge to get somebody from ultimately from death to life? and that you can spend eternity with because you just were bold enough to have that conversation that maybe you didn't want to have, but the spirit nudged you to have it and you were obedient to it. That's so good. I, yeah, following Jesus is not um, just coming to church and being an observer. You know, it's being in relationship. <clears throat> it's being in relationship with people and it's being in accountability to people. You know, showing up every week, knowing that you're going to talk about God's word and I mean, now for you, your greatest disciples are two little girls, right? And uh, you're two years into that journey. How does it translate into making disciples of your daughters? Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, uh, it's very <laughs> <I know>. hard. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm still figuring it out. Don't get me wrong. I, I, for one, I don't think I'll ever have it figured out. Um, but it requires a lot of patience, as those with kids know. Um, but, you know, for us, you know, our oldest is two, and it's just, there's only so much she can learn and really understand right now, but can we just add spiritual disciplines into our life that we can model and she can see? So we're going to go to bed. We're going to say our prayers together. We're going to pray before our meals, which is actually really cute because now she prays um, and you never know what you're going to get. Um, and oftentimes it's interrupted by a bite of the 
fruit or the snack or whatever's in front of her face. Um, but we get through the prayers. Um, but it's just spiritual disciplines that we can just start to just kind of drop nuggets and just uh, never going to force anything, but just hope that we can just integrate those spiritual disciplines into our life, into her life, and that God will kind of just take that and run with it and, you know, continue to allow her to grow into the woman um, that God's called her to be. And so trying to figure that out. Um, again, two and seven months old look a little different than four and two in a couple of years and all those things. And so there's a lot of big questions and big decisions and a lot of things that we'll have to kind of navigate as they come up, um, especially in the crazy world we live in now. Um, but, you know, we're just taking it day by day and trying to be in tune with the spirit to just raise them well and, and ideally model what it looks like to chase after Christ, not only as individuals, but in our marriage as well. Yeah. And let me tell you, you got to pray for Carson because I met Hadley backstage and she was like, daddy, can I have a fruit snack, please? And I was like, dude, give her the box. Like <laughs> the cutest, sweetest, most polite little girl. And so until you say no, yeah, until yeah, you say okay. no, that's so. <laughs> But good luck not being wrapped around her finger, yeah. man. Yeah. She's, they're, they're sweet, precious, precious blessings from God in your life. And, yes, they are. Um, hey, I know a verse that means a lot to you is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's tattooed on your arm, and it's something that you live by. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him or acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And I look at your life over the last couple of years, and it feels like a windy road, in some ways more than a straight path, you know, but uh, I know for you, you've stayed steadfast, principled in how you followed Jesus and how have you trusted God even when things have changed or not been how you expected? Yeah, I think that verse has been a staple in my life. Um, that's why I put it on my arm uh, as just a reminder um, because it's easy to believe, um, but it's harder to kind of execute. And I think, you know, when it says trust in the Lord with all your heart, that first part, I'm like, okay, I can trust in the Lord with all my heart. Uh, at least what I think that means I can do. And then the next part says, lean not on your own understanding. And as men, uh, and as a man, you know, I like to think, well, I can figure this out. If there's a problem, I can fix it. I'm going to, I'm going to solve a problem. Uh, you know, I think I'm probably not the only one in this room that might struggle with control issues, uh, wanting things to look a certain way. And so, you know, the, the Bible says, lean not on your own understanding. And then the next part's where the real challenge comes in. In all your ways, submit to him. In all your ways. And it's, it's, it's this constant reminder. It's not just some of your ways. It's everything. Submit to him. And submission is hard. Yeah. Submission is, is not usually the easy thing to do and not the common thing that people do, you know, in, in everything. But submitting to God every moment, every step of the way, the, the good the bad and the ugly, and just saying, God, okay, this is your path. But he ends by saying, I'll make your path straight. And it might not be the path you thought. Maybe your path you thought was going over here, but God's like, I'm taking you over here. But the prize at the end is what we're chasing, and that's eternity with Christ. And so to go on that path, that's the path I want to take. That's the path I want to take in everyday surrender. I think that's so true. You can look at your life and think, man, the path is anything but straight, but it's possible to walk a straight path before God, even when your path through life seems difficult or takes you places you didn't expect. I know that five years ago when you were here, I think it was five years, something like that, um, I committed to you, hey, I'm going to pray for you. This church is going to pray for you. I think that's why it's so rewarding when you come back because uh, I know people have committed to your journey in their own heart, not just watching you on a television, but praying for you and what the AO1 Foundation is doing. And uh, I know as you walked through kind of the craziness of this last year, I prayed for you more. And I was one of the people, you know, that threw you a text. I was like praying for you. I didn't even know if you knew what was going on, you know, but um, just wanted to be consistent in that. And I remember you getting traded and processing through that and then showing up in Washington at a new facility, new coach, new team. Very quickly thereafter, you walked up to the door and Coach Ron Rivera walked out the door. And I remember seeing a video of him look at you and he said, I want you to know that you're in a place where you're wanted. And I thought, thank God for that man, you know, to use those words. Yeah, and just the power of those words in that moment. So I'm wondering, what were you going through at that moment when you got the call, and then what did those words mean to you? 
Yeah. Um, so that was a wild ride because one day I'm in my backyard in Indy pushing Hadley on the swing and you get a call, you're going to Washington. And the next morning you're on a plane. The next morning you're standing in front of cameras saying how excited you are to be a commander when you've really had no time to process anything. Um, and so, I mean, call a spade a spade. There's a lot to process. There's a lot of emotions going on. Um, and so to walk up to that door with all of those emotions kind of going through my heart and in my head, and for him to say, you know, you're wanted here, um, it means a lot. And it, it impacts and kind of changes your perspective as you go forward. Um, but it also, I know what it did for me in that moment. Um, and then really the next couple of days and weeks as we process, okay, this is happening, this transition, all of this. But it also reminded me the power of our words and the power of what you never maybe know what someone's going on uh, inside in their mind or in their heart. But you have the power to speak life into a situation, to change someone's outlook, to change someone's perspective um, just by your words. And I've seen that in my own marriage, you know, when I'm able to be intentional and choose words wisely uh, with my wife, with my kids, I've seen it in friendships and relationships. I've seen when I don't use my words well and I, you know, it can bring, you know, negative feelings. And so there's so much power in the words that you say and how you can uplift others and how you can bring people uh, joy in moments that maybe they shouldn't have joy. You know, you never know what people are going through. And so that was just kind of this nugget of truth that I think God revealed to me of just, hey, there's power in those words because of how much you felt that loved and valued and wanted in that moment. Now you can go reciprocate that uh, with others. So uh, that's just a nugget that I would throw your way um, to just be intentional with the words that you speak uh, with people. Yeah. I think about right after you were here, you had an MVP caliber season going on in Philadelphia and uh, went diving into an end zone, took a hit, messed up your knee and, uh, actually ended up being on a stage with your team lifting the Lombardi trophy. But the caveat is that you were in street clothes in that moment, a dream, you know, of winning a Super Bowl coming to pass. Yet there was this disappointment, you know, that was attached to it. And I know a lot of us uh, walk through disappointment. You can look at somebody like Carson, I think, and say, well, he still got paid. You know, how bad could it be? He's an NFL quarterback. But uh, I think we found in our world that no amount of money can uh, deal with you can't pay enough to get rid of pain, you know, and pain is relative and we all walk through it no matter um, what other things we have going on in our lives. And I know there's joy and elation in that moment, but probably pain and disappointment as well that season. So how did you navigate the disappointment of that moment? Yeah, um, that was a, a definitely a trying time. You know, I know, um, you know, I come into the league and I'm actively following Christ and, you know, I have this motto of audience of one and um, it was really, things were going great. You know, I have this, I'm living for Christ, I'm playing for Christ, and we're having a successful season. I'm having a successful season. The highs, the highs are high and everything's going well. And, you know, I always, I always would joke, like if I was the guy in the, in the, uh, on the crutches or I was the guy in the training room, cause I don't sit still well, I'm busy, I'm an active guy. And so I was like, I don't know how I would fare in that situation. And then I found myself in that situation um, and it was, it just took me to a so much deeper spiritual place of surrender that I've never been before. Um, you know, when I physically couldn't even move my knee, like a foot, foot, move my leg a foot, I couldn't get up from the couch to get a glass of water. I couldn't do anything. And I just ultimately needed, I needed my wife who was my girlfriend at the time, but I needed Christ. Like I just couldn't do it myself. And then that just took me to a new place of surrender, literally, um, because as a man, and especially the profession I have, you know, you're always just relying on your body to perform. You're always doing that. So like my body just couldn't do anything. So it gave me a new perspective. But then as we, the season then unfolds and we go on and we're winning the playoffs and we're in the Super Bowl now. I mean, I was the kid at recess at Centennial Elementary School down the road that I was pretending I was in the Super Bowl every time I went out there. Um, I would bring the football. Like, you, you dream of these moments. You dream of these things. And it finally is fulfilled. It comes to that moment. And I'm standing on that stage holding that trophy. But like you said, I'm in street clothes. And it's, it's still a lot of joy and elation and celebration. And you're, you're excited for your teammates. But I um, had to walk through it from a different perspective. And uh, di didn't go how I envisioned it. Um, but I'm also thankful now, especially a couple years later, because I think that kind of prepared me for the adversity and the highs and lows that we're, that I'm walking through now. 
uh, of just this ultimate surrender of saying, God, I'm not just going to say I surrender to you, but I'm going to try and live it out. Um, and that's with everything. And that's my career. That's every step of the way and say, I'm going to work at it because the Bible says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for a human master. So I'm like, okay, God, I'm in this moment. You've put me here for a reason. I'm going to work at it with all my heart, but you're going to establish my steps. You're going to establish my way. Um, and so I'm going to do that and execute it, but I'm going to surrender it every day to you. And I have to remind myself every day to surrender it to, to him because how quickly in this world you can get thrown off. Um, and so I have to remind myself that every single step of the way, but, uh, I'm thankful for that, um, that injury back then, just because of how much it changed my perspective on life, changed my perspective on my profession. And it allowed me to understand what true surrender meant in that moment, um, to surrender, not just some things, but everything to God. Yeah. Yeah. There's... Every time you talk about that, I think back to Abraham and God asks Abraham for a sacrifice that really felt like everything to him. And he walks all the way up the mountain, is ready to make the sacrifice. And God says, never mind, don't make the sacrifice. I just want to know if you'd be obedient and provides a different sacrifice. And I think in all of our lives, we come to moments where God asks us for something. And maybe it's something that we hold very dear, you know, and I feel like you walked through that. And I think what God is actually searching for is and, and is asking of us, it's not that God wants to punish us by taking away things that we love. I think God just leads us to moments of surrender and sacrifice to see if we will worship him the same way uh, on the mountain as we do in the valley, to see if we'll worship him the same way, whether we make the sacrifice or whether we don't. And to me, that is what sets you apart as a follower of Jesus is uh, it's harder to worship when things don't go your way, but I know that you're a person who still is going to worship God. You know, you're still going to, and I, I would give that encouragement to everybody here that no matter what is coming your way, uh, does your worship dictate how you feel and your situation, or does your situation dictate your worship? And really saying, no, I'm going to worship God mountain high, valley low, mm -hmm. no matter what it is that I walk through. And I've just seen you do that so beautifully and, and consistently. And, uh, even, and I think the next part is actually the harder part in my mind, and maybe you'd say that's not true, but is the criticism that comes with it, you know, of not only walking through difficulty, but then having people uh, get paid a lot of money to criticize you as a player. And I think especially this last year, they went further and they said, it's not enough. We don't, we also feel like we should be able to criticize Carson as a person and uh, not knowing you. And I just want to be like, I'm not the first one to say it, but it's just a load of crap. Okay, it's the 1230, so we're just going to say crap in this service. But because people write stuff that they want you to click on, yeah. you know, but this is a person of integrity and character who worships God no matter what season they walk through. But how have you guys navigated that when there's so many voices, so many people talking, you're trending on Twitter, whatever it is, how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely um, a spiritual side of navigating and tangible ways that uh, my wife and I try to um, kind of set ourselves up for success when it comes to that stuff. I mean, tangibly, we try and stay off social media. We, we avoid it as much as we can. Um, you know, we'll go post things and then I'll go delete my Instagram like the same day. Um, and different things like that to just tangibly kind of say, you know, we don't need to even give the enemy a foothold of, of anything uh, in our life. And we don't really turn the TV on in our house other than now I turn on the golf channel because they're not talking about me on the golf channel. Uh, not yet anyway, maybe one day. Um, but we just try to avoid it. But to be frank, like you're going to see it. You're going to hear it. Things are said. Um, you're going to hear it from maybe teammates or coaches or agents or different people, family members. I mean, I'll be doing fine. And then next thing you know, someone, Hey, are you doing all right? And it's, I was, but should I be worried about something else now? Uh, is there something going on that I don't know about? And, um, you know, I think for me, I have to constantly go back to the word. Um, and I go to Galatians 1:10. it's a simple passage, but am I now trying to win the approval of God or of men? And it's a simple question, but it's, it's this real truth of like, am I trying to win the approval of other people? Am I really worried about what other people say, think, or feel? Or am I worried about what God 
says, thinks, or feels. And what God says is in the word, and that's unchanging. How he sees me, how he loves me, that's not gonna change based on my performance or how I do. Um, and so I have, try to have that perspective, but I need to have that perspective every day. And it's, it's something, you know, the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind because the world wants to tell you a certain thing. The world is gonna constantly inundate you and your mind and your heart with crap. It's going to inundate you with everything. And you have to say, what's going to win? Is the world going to win or is the word going to win in my life? And so you have to do that every single morning and surrender that. Is the word going to win or is the world going to win? Such a great thought. Uh, What are you excited about? Just in life right now, what are you dreaming about? Yeah. What are you hoping for the future? I told you I was going to go off the notes yeah, in the it's a great question. But. It's a great question. And to be honest, I've always been um, very much, uh, and my wife can attest to this, I, I have to remind myself often to live in the moment because I very much am often thinking of what's next. And sometimes I'm a visionary in a good way, and sometimes I'm thinking too much. Um, and so lately, if there's been one thing that God's continuing to remind me is to be present, is to maximize every opportunity to live in the moment you know, we didn't think we'd be in Virginia. We didn't think we'd be playing for Washington. We didn't think any of these things. And so this vision I had looks different. And so for me, it's just how can I be obedient with this next step? You know, I think we have high expectations, high hopes for the future of the foundation, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a few minutes um, and all of that. And, you know, I'm enjoying the heck out of raising my kids and look forward to seeing them grow um, and all of those things, but we don't, I'm trying to think less about the future in that respect because that is my tendency. It's my, my fleshly tendency. And sometimes God just says, Hey, be present, be where you are, maximize each opportunity. Cause you never know when it's your last. It's awesome. Why don't you go ahead? Why don't you go ahead and talk about the foundation? I know it's close to your heart and it uh, came out of right after your first year, right? Your rookie season. But what, what is the foundation doing now? What is it? Yeah, so it's the AO1 Foundation. Um, stands for Audience of One, which really became my life motto um, in college, which helped me on the field, but also in everything I do that I'm just, I'm trying to do it for the Lord. Like we just talked about that Galatians 1.10 mindset or the Colossians 323 mindset of just doing it for the Lord. Um, and so that's the audience of one. And that's the name of the foundation, um, which we started in 17. Like you said, it was just me and my older brother, Zach, uh, didn't know what the heck we were doing, didn't know how we wanted to give back or how we wanted to make a difference. But we said, we're just going to take a leap of faith and start this. Um, and it's always been the same. We've always wanted to physically bless people, but also spiritually bless people. You know, we didn't want one without the other. Um, And so we uh, now have three ministries. We have the uh, sports complex in Haiti, which is really cool. Um, We built a sports complex down there that has a big full-size turf soccer field, um, two basketball courts, and uh, underneath a covering and overhang, and then a building with locker rooms. And it is unbelievable because it sticks out like an absolute sore thumb down there because you see this big green piece of turf, which we take for granted, um, but turf down there is non-existent. It's not a real thing. So these kids get the opportunity to come and, and feel loved and feel hope because they have something to go play on. They're not just playing on the rocks, rock bed or the dirt patch um, down the road from where they live. They're showing up. They're getting uniforms. They're wearing uniforms. There's referees. The other villages are coming around. They're also getting a free meal, which we take for granted, which is also very hard to get over there sometimes as well. Uh, and they're also being trained and raised up to be young men and women of God, which is really cool. Um, so that's the first one. We have a food truck. Uh, thank you. And then we have uh, a couple food trucks. It's called Thy Kingdom Crumb, um, which is, I forgot to mention the Did name. Did you come up with that? Services. Um, Who's responsible for the name? I don't want to brag, but yes. Um, it's, that's, that's good. We <laughs> Naming that was fun and stressful. Like we were like, this thing's about to unveil and we do not have a name yet. 
Um, so that Kingdom Crumb, we have one in Philly and one in Indy that just goes around and gives out free food um, to anybody and everybody. And then we also have team members that are out there praying with people, um, introducing them to Christ, providing resources, books, whatever, um, which has been really cool to see the stories and the feedback. Most people are a little caught off guard. They're like, what's the catch? And it's like, no, just take the food. Like, it's free. Um, and so that's been really fun. And then we have an outdoor ministry, which is kind of two part. Uh, we have Camp Conquerors, um, and then we have Mountain Movers. Camp Conquerors actually is wrapping up today, and then we have another one tomorrow uh, up in Washburn, so right down the road here. And we get kids that are all, you know, have gone through a life-threatening illness or a severe challenge growing up or still maybe walking through it as, the, as we speak. Um, and we get them to this camp where they feel loved and celebrated, and all these kids come together and just rally around each other. Um, and they have a lot of fun doing outdoor activities. They're shooting archery, they're riflery, they're in the water, paddle boarding, you name it. They're doing it, playing sports events. We just played archery tag. Uh, I was out there, so it's like a little paintball thing with archery. I was shooting the kids. It was a lot of fun. Uh, they were better than me, though, because I'm a much bigger target than them. Um, so we were doing all that this week, and then they're going to do it next week as well. Um, and then we take those same types of kids on these, we call them mountain movers hunts, and we're getting them on hunting, fishing, hiking, camping trips. And it's a lot of fun because I know what the outdoors has meant to me and how much I've grown as a man, uh, also in relationships with other people that I get to share the outdoors with, but also in my faith because I get to see when I'm sitting in a tree stand and I see just God's creation come to life. It just gives me a different perspective of, of who God is and his magnitude. Um, and so we've wanted to provide that opportunity Wanted to provide that opportunity to kids as well um, that have gone through some of these things. Um, but the same thing holds true. They're going to go on this trip, but they're also at night going to be prayed with. They're going to go through a devotional. They're going to go through the word. Um, and some of the stories that we hear are, they give me chills because it's, we're not just impacting the kid that's on the trip, but we're impacting their families, their parents. Um, we're getting calls and texts and emails about just how maybe a dad wasn't walking with the Lord, but their kid went on this trip. And next thing you know, they're going to church with their family. And there's just so many things that it's like, it's so much bigger than just that one kid that goes on that trip. And so we've seen a lot of uh, fruit of that work um, lately, and it's been a lot of fun. So we look forward to growing those ministries in whatever way God has for them. But uh, it's been really cool to see uh, God's kind of hand over all of it. It is so cool. And I'll brag on it a little bit. It says, uh, I got some stats, and I think these might be even a little dated, but over 100,000 meals have been served through Thy Kingdom Crumb. Uh, 159 campers, that number went up this weekend, have gone through Camp Conquerors. Uh, 66 adventurers through Mountain Movers. 414 family packs through Outdoor Ministries. 10,000 plus children supported through the Haiti Sports Complex and your partnership with Mission of Hope. So out of all the different ways that you could have used your influence and your resources, the fact that you have invested in those things is so awesome and commendable. So thank you for giving back. We're going to wrap up in, in just a second, but I just want to say to you, Carson, like, I know you get a lot of accolades for like what you do. And I just want you to know that we respect you for who you are. And I know that is the bigger goal in life because you've talked about it. Like this season of football will end at some point, you know, and I know you're going to outplay Tom Brady, but well, we'll see. But <laughs> Um, I don't know if I'd want to be playing football at 45, if I'm honest. I'm 36, and I'm like, I don't think I could do it. But, uh, but I, I love and appreciate that who you are is something that you put just as much emphasis on as what you do. I think there's a lot of people who put their whole identity into what they do. And then when what they do goes up and down, they go up and down. Um, but you've invested so much in who you are. And I can see it in how you built your family and in the things that you talk about. And I've just been honored to sit with you today and just hear you share your heart. And more and more, I, I told the other service, I feel less of a need to be here because what you're, you're sharing is just so good and so full of truth. And I think it speaks to how you've grown in your faith and as a follower of Jesus. And that is inspirational. You know, more than anything else, that is, that's an inspiration to us. So uh, I want to make sure you hear that because I know you hear about all the other accolades, but who you are is impressive and it's exciting when we look to the future. So thank you for that. What we want to do um, for a moment is I know there's some of you that 
Uh, maybe you came into this room and you're very much where Carson was when he was in high school. Maybe you're a different age than he was, but your faith has been very works-based. You've been trying to make your own way to God or um, you just feel like you've been separated from Jesus in your journey uh, of faith. And you're here today to see Carson, but as you've listened to Carson, you've not seen Carson, you've seen Jesus and uh, working through Carson. And that has created something in your heart or in your spirit that says, man, I want, I want that. I want that kind of faith. I want to make that same decision. And so what would you say to anybody who's kind of on the fence today in that decision? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was right there. I was right there. And uh, I'd say when you're living a life of trying to be good enough, you are never fulfilled and you never have peace. And you will always be striving to do something more, do something greater. Always look to your left, look to your right. Am I good enough? Um, and that's not how God designed us. That's not how God created um, his spirit and his son. Uh, and that's not why he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to die for us so that we could have eternal life. Because like I said earlier, we will never be good enough. We can never be good enough. But Jesus already did it for us. And it just... That changed my life just dramatically in college, just understanding that love um, and, and everything and just surrendering it to him. And then it took me to a place of, okay, well, I want to know what are all these other religions in the world about? Like, why choose this Jesus guy uh, over something else? And it, it's the same thing. It's, it's always, am I good enough? Can I be good enough? Can I earn something in which we all know as followers of Christ? We can't. We simply can't earn it. And it's exhausting trying to. It is absolutely exhausting. You will run yourself ragged and you will never measure up. But Jesus already did. And all we have to do is surrender ourselves and give him our life. And it has been the most freeing. It has been the most joyful. And I promise you, it doesn't mean your life is going to be easy. Quite frankly, sometimes it gets harder. But the eternal reward and what's waiting at the end of the road is far beyond anything that we can ever ask, think, or imagine. And I promise you that. And run the race, walk the walk, so that one day we're all standing before the Lord and we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, because that is all that we should be striving for. Come on. That's so good. Hey, so let's just take a moment of personal reflection. If you just all bow your heads close your eyes for a moment. If there's anybody here today and you say, man, I want what Carson just described. I'm not going to belabor the point, but you're here today and you say, that's me. Would you just lift your hand and say, Pastor Josh, that's me. This is by lifting my hand, I'm surrendering and saying, God, I want you to work in my heart in this way. God, I don't want it to be about my works anymore. God, I want to live surrendered to you. I see many hands going up. Anybody else? That's the decision you want to make today. The Bible says that if you're making that decision, here's what you need to do right now. Romans 10, 9 says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. God, I surrender to you. I confess that you are Lord of my life. I need you. I, I accept your free gift of salvation. And then it says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus was the savior of the world. And saying, God, I believe, maybe there's some areas where I doubt or I have unbelief, so help my unbelief, but I believe today. And I put my hope and my trust in you. And if you pray that prayer, if you call out to God that way, the Bible tells us that you will be saved. And it's God's will for you to be saved today. And as a deposit of that saving grace of Jesus, he's giving you his Holy Spirit right now. He's going to fill you and who's going to help you. He's going to teach you how to, to know his word and to live out this decision that you're making right now. Carson, would you pray for everybody who made that decision today? Dear Jesus, we just thank you. Um, thank you for this space. Thank you for your presence here. Um, for your word says where two or more gather in your name, you are there with them. And God, we know that your presence is here. Uh, but we ask that your presence would go with us as we go into this world um, and that we strive to make a difference, strive to live on mission, that you would just allow our eyes to be open and see the way you would have us see um, so that we may love others and just live a life uh, that is different than this world. God, that is a life that is chasing after you. God, we just thank you for those that raised their hand and accepted you for the first time. We celebrate them as we know that you are celebrating uh, with all the angels in heaven, God, because it is a glorious moment. Um, and we just thank you that you love us so much to come and die on that cross for us, God. Uh, may that grace and may the gospel never get old to us. May we just live on mission for you. I just pray a blessing of health and uh, protection and that you would just give us wisdom as we navigate this crazy world. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. Come on, give it up for everybody who made that decision today. Hey, thanks for joining the conversation again today on Highly Unlikely with Josh and Janae. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, share it with your friends, let them know about it, like it, whatever you need to do. And uh, we're so excited for you to join us next time on this podcast.